Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rustan Leno, and um, I am very pleased to introduce um, Nera Amin, who has been uh, uh, spending well a week with us here, and will spend uh, this week as well. But uh, before then, she has um, done um, a lot of work with uh, using using Daphne, and she's now learning how to um, uh, hack in uh, in the Daphne sources as well to uh, add the improvements that that she would like. Um, now, uh, Nera has um, 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 like a, a developer history as well, from um, having worked at uh, at Microsoft as an intern some number of years ago, and uh, worked at uh, Google as a um, developer as well, right? For um, in uh, Zurich, and is now at EPFL, uh, studying with um, for her PhD with uh, Martin Odersky. Okay. So take it away. Right. Thank you, Mister. Thank you for inviting me to MSR. It's been a lot of fun to finally dabble with the Daphne internals. But this talk is going to be from a user's perspective. I've been using Daphne to do meta theory of programming languages. And I've done both textbook examples and research level paper examples and also used it in my own research where I wasn't really sure where I, I was going and using Daphne to, to guide me a little bit in the, both in the design and in the proofs. But for this, uh, for this talk, I'll start with a textbook example, which is uh, uh, modeling the simply typed lambda calculus and then mechanically proving its uh, syntactic type soundness. And um, I, I, what I hope to convey here is that in terms of modeling, Daphne doesn't really bring so much more than, than Coq, but it's really when you do the proofs that you get a lot of um, mileage out of using Daphne. So first, we'll, we'll still look at the model. And I'm, I'm starting to define some, I, I, here I'm defining a data type for, for option, which is really like just a, um, uh, kind of like a, may, the many, maybe monad in Haskell or something like this. And I'm using it because I, I often want to use, uh, have functions that sometimes return a result and sometimes not, like the step function of um, operational semantics or the typing function. Not every term has a type. So I, I'll be using the option monad for this. And then uh, for my, for my um, base, base types of the simply typed calculus, Calc uh, lambda calculus, I'll, um, I'll have this opaque base type to start with. So this is, this is just uh, some type that you can't really match <coughs> anything else against, except itself. And then recursively, you define this arrow type, which, which takes a parameter type and a return type, T2. And then for the terms, we have variables, application, and abstraction. And the Actually, here I should just say that the abstraction also takes the, the type T. OK, so in terms of, yeah? Is there any question? No, no. I, OK. I, I yeah? have a question. So is the, the, the variable, you're going to represent it by just uh, yeah, so, concrete names? Or so it? yeah, I'm using integers as concrete names. Okay. I'm not using any fancy encoding for for the purpose of this calculus, this is going to be enough because we only deal with closed terms, so we don't have any issues with variable capture. But of course, if we want to extend this to other settings, like, uh, like for example, in system F, where you also have uh, type applications, and here you can have capture, uh, it's, it's, it, it will need to, uh, we'll need to be a bit more sophisticated. But here I'm using the simple encoding, and this is also the same uh, as the encoding used in the, in the COC, um, uh, Coq development from, uh, from foundations of software. Okay, so in terms of operational semantics, we just define what is a value in our language. And for, for here, we, it, we'll say that any lambda, any lambda abstraction is a value. And then here, there is some boilerplate in terms of defining uh, free variables in substitution. So the, the interesting case is really that so f of, f of v says that um, it, it computes the set of free variables of t, of a term t. And the interesting case is if we have a variable, then we just return its ID in the set. If we have an abstraction, then we compute the free variables of the body, but we remove the 
the bound variable x because it's, it's not free, it's bound. And then the other case are just uh, recursing over and, and, and unioning the, the, the free variables we find. Yes? So usually in fact you have to define all this set, what they are and what they're not. So what do you get here? Yeah, so, so Daphne has a primitive for set. And it, it, it knows already about, um, it, knows, it has already some axioms about sets, so it, it knows things such that if you remove x from the set here, then this whole, this set here will not have x anymore and things like this. Does this answer your question? Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. And then, and then substitution is also a bit boilerplate, but it's the, it's the same pattern, so if we have a variable um, x prime, I'm, I'm just, so, okay, just to recap, substitution says that we, we have a term t and we replace all free occurrences of x with s, another term s. And the interesting case is if we have a free variable x prime, then we just, we go ahead and do the substitution if it matches, uh, if the vari variable matches, otherwise we leave the term unchanged. And here, this is uh, where Nikhil's comment comes in. We're, we're only dealing with um, uh, when we're only dealing with cases where s is closed. So this is okay. In general, if s can have free variables, let's say s had this variable x prime, then we're doing the substitution. We're, we're ha we have s here, and this x prime would capture the the free variable. Um, X prime that is in S. So we're assuming that S is closed, and this will show up in the proofs as well. But for now, we, we're not worrying about it so much. Okay, and then application is just, uh, just a recursive case. So with this, we can define our. Yes? You could easily fix that, right? But just, mm -hmm. uh, you don't need more fancy encodings, right? You can kind of just remove. Uh, you have to do? So no, what, the yeah, so what I, what I could do is, this, this is a bound variable. Yeah, this is a bound variable, so I could, I could rename it to something else. Right. But then if you start to do renaming, um, I, you could do that, but then you also need a way to compare um, terms that have different names right. but are still equivalent. So you need a... Well, it's, it's just a alpha equivalent, so it's, it's doable. I mean, but I think using a different encoding might be more useful. So in, in COG, they have this library for locally nameless encoding where you use um, the, the Brugine indices for when you, when you are in a local setting when, with bound variables, but in a, in a global setting, you still use these, these names. So we could, do, we could do things like this. I've, I've played with, with this, but... Yeah, for this example, I'm, I'm glossing over that. So mm -hmm. you could still use concrete names and just alpha convert t before substituting, and but uh, you don't necessarily need to yep. reason about alpha equivalence just to do syntactic type safety, right? Uh, yeah, maybe not in this case, yeah. But uh, I, I, I was thinking ahead of, of cases where you would need to. Okay. So you yeah. could do alpha okay. rename and go on. No, it's fine. I mean, I, yeah, I don't mind interruptions, but uh, I, I'll, I'll show later how you can do this as well, like this, this alpha rename. Okay, so uh, for the reduction relation, so here we see that if we compare with ML or other language, we have less facilities for pattern matching because we can't really have uh, uh, nested, nested, uh, nested pattern matching. Like here I have to explicitly have these if statements, but this is basically saying if I have uh, an application and the function part is an abstraction and the uh, the argument part is a value, then I can go ahead and do the beta reduction, so the substitution. Otherwise, these are just uh, congruent uh, cases ag again. I can, I can step on the, on the function side, or I can step on the argument side. And I chose to make my function deterministic. I mean, anyway, it's going to be deterministic because I'm using these if statements, but I'm just being explicit about the fact that I'm only stepping on the argument when, when f is already a value. Okay, and then you can define a multi-step uh, relation. And this is really, if you, if you look at the, the step function and think of it as a, it's a partial function, so think of it as a relation. And then this is really just the reflexive transitive closure of that relation. And here we're taking n for the number of steps we're doing. 
Okay, so we can do some examples, and this one Daphne figures out automatically. And now on to typing. Yeah, yeah. So this is just saying if I write it in, I have lambda x, which takes a base type and returns x. And then I'm applying this to lambda x. Then that just returns lambda x vx. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> okay. Is this the uh, recent uh, extra? No, not yet. This one was actually proved automatically. I'll show. This one is just one step. Yeah, right. yeah, it's just one step. That's why I'm saying n just has to be greater than zero. But yeah. that's for now, it's not more of a theorem than just an ironic of a function application. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. This was just. Uh, it's kind of like writing a test with. Uh, right. Yeah. All right. So, so typing. So first, I'm using maps. This is also a Daphne data type, um, internal data type, to to represent a partial map from variable names to types. And you can look things up in the map. So I, I'm I'm just and you can extend the map as well. So I'm going to use these these uh, abstractions over the the map. And the, the, the typing relation is, um, is uh, syntax directed. So we have one case for var, apps, and uh, an app. And here we see that, OK, it's not that pretty because of this monad. But that's why I, I've put these, uh, these checks a bit here so that they don't, uh, they don't affect the main flow, which is, which is here. So for, for a variable, we, we just look it up in the context. For an abstraction, we, we type the body in an extended context and then um, return a, a narrow type where the, 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 the type of the body is, is in the result of the arrow. And then for application, we just type the function and the argument. And we, we check that the, the function is actually an arrow and that it agrees with the argument. And then we return the result of the function. OK, so now we've, we're done with our model. Mm -hmm. uh, you chose to write the typing relation as a function, mm -hmm. uh, which in the simply type lambda calculus is um, like you know it's reasonably yeah. natural. Yeah. But one would normally write it as a relation. Yeah. Uh, I, c I can also do this. Yeah. Okay. In my own uh, in my own research work, I, I've mostly used relations, okay. Okay. and it's it makes more sense because even there sometimes I wasn't sure if if something is decidable, so then you really don't have a choice mm -hmm. but use a relation, mm -hmm. and. And you can also work with uh, with with uh, undecidable things if you if you also have a step index and things sure. like this. And what's nice in Daphne is that mutual induction works really nicely. So even if you have a step index, you can it, it makes it really easy to do mutual, mutual induction on things. Yes. The semantic of bar here similar to that. The semantic of what? Sorry. Bar. Bar. Going body is similar to that. Uh, so var is just. Uh, uh, a variable. It is a let. Oh, the var. Sorry, uh, the yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you have to write decreases t. Uh, let's see. Oh wow, it's a little bit fine. Yeah. So I guess it's it's no, getting. It's not very smart about it. No, so it's getting <laughs> confused because here we're extending the context, so the context is not decreasing. Yeah, well, but the second variable. Yeah. Is always the, yeah, decreasing. but it, it just has some defaults, so here we just need to be... Should complain to Mr. Rooster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. But if you have a yeah. So yeah, if I switch the parameter, it would have worked, because it, oh, it works, really? yeah. yeah. By default, it's the lexicographic tuple of the, or of the arguments in the order given. Yeah. Sorry, I was still falling off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here are some examples. Again, this is just testing, not, not proofs yet. And here we, we actually have to do more work in some cases. And the reason is that Daphne just does a bit of unfolding and, and not much. I, I'm, I'm finally understanding this. But with, with Rustin, we have some ideas on, on how to change this so that you wouldn't need to, to assert the intermediate steps. But anyway, that was just to give some examples. We don't need to, to go 
to them in details. I, I want to get to the type safety properties. So for, for type safety, we're, we're going to, yes? Why is it working that you're using integers instead of variables? So? Like names, you mean? Yeah. Well, because Daphne doesn't have strings, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, so for the for for the type safety theorems, we're we're going to do syntactic soundness, so progress and preservation. And the way to read this this ghost method is really just something that's there for verification, so it doesn't get compiled into code. And the way to read it is that the requires clauses are like hypothesis of your lemma or theorem, and the ensures clause are like the conclusions. So here we're saying that if a term t has a type in the empty context, then either it's a value or it, it steps. It can take some step. And first, let's just look at how this is done in, on paper and in COG to prove this. So is this readable or? Yeah. So in, on paper, you would really do an induction on the, on the typing derivation. And then there are a few cases. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. But I mean, you, you still have to reason through them. And then in COG, this is how it would look. So it's a, it's a very long proof. And already, it's using some automation with these dot, dot, dot. And yeah, so that's the end of the proof. So it is these magic things, right? They have to like, yeah. destruct or, or yeah, so the, yeah, so you need to understand these ta this tactic language. So for example, um, this is saying. Destruct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is doing do, do an induction on, on the derivation. And then, uh, well, here we're going to use, it's, it's hard to read without having the context, the interactive context of the proof. But anyway, I just wanted to give you a flavor of what it looks. No, I mean, mm -hmm. the strange thing about this is you have to know a lot about the tactics engine yeah. to guide it in the right way. It's, just, yeah. it's what I call the magic words, like destruct yeah. or, yeah. or diversion or something uh, to guide it along. OK, and this is how it looks in Daphne. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so not all proofs are going to be that easy, but this one it, it figured out automatically. Because it's, it's, a, yeah, it's just an induction on the typing derivation, and so it could, it could fill this out. Is it, is it doing an induction on the typing derivation or on the term? I think here it's doing it on the term. But what, what happens is that it has this, this hypothesis, which is the, the type, right? So at the end, it can really, when it's, when it's in, the, in the, say it's when it's the abstraction case, it can use the induction hypothesis from, that's, that comes from this uh, typing the, the, full the, the full abstraction. So at the end, it's, it's equivalent to doing a, a typing derivation on the, on the term because you, you kind of, you're, you're kind of doing a case analysis. Uh, I'll show a, an, another example of this later. Yeah? Yeah. Everything and nothing is automatic. Like that, that's no that's fair, fair, but it's kind of the the default way to do things. If you if you want to to go fancy and cock, it takes some. It no, actually it takes some thinking to to uh, to really automate and um, and do proofs that are modular. But in Daphne, it, it kind of comes for free. Okay, so now we're going to do preservation using the substitution lemma first, and here are just some. Um, some lemmas that I'm, I, I also took from the, the textbook, and Daphne proved them automatically. So here I had to give a hint to Daphne that says, do an induction where you generalize over both C and T. And the reason, oops, uh, the reason you need to generalize over the context as well is because you have the abstraction case. So anyway, this says that if X is a free variable of T, and T has some type in some context, then this context definitely has x, uh, definitely binds x. And, and then, mm -hmm. So uh, I was wondering about the, the process by which you arrived at these uh, uh, ways yeah. of stating things. So yes. When mm -hmm. you wrote the progress thing, were you just like really surprised that it just went through? Yeah, I was surprised. <laughs> so when you got to lemma free in context, how did you discover the, uh, that you know, you, maybe you tried the first time to see if it would go through automatically and it probably didn't? Yeah, so I, I, I did. OK, so let's, let's remove this. So here it's going to complain that something, 
And this one is actually a, a bit of a, of a tricky one. There's a, there's a bit of a, a, a bug, so I'm just going to repeat. I mean, I'm just going to go through it, but just, uh, just gloss over this bug. So here it says it, it doesn't know how to prove the. Oh, um, not yet. yeah, not yet. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wait, that worked. Oh, that's weird. Okay, so this is this one is a bit buggy, but. Um, yeah, this, this doesn't make much sense that if you repeat. But in general, I'll show how you. Can you show the error message? Yeah, so it just doesn't. It just doesn't know. Um, oh right. So, so if you add insurers, maybe yeah. uh, Daphne gets helped just a little bit more in how to find it though. So yeah, I think so. Insurers, it yeah, it. there's there's something strange going on with this example, but in, but usually it's it's. Um, it's a bit more straightforward. So I'll show some examples later of how you do some derivations. OK. So then we're only interested in closed terms. So this is how we define closed terms. J just saying that x does, for, all, for any variable x, it's not in the, in the free variables of t. Why don't you just say f of t equals n? Yeah, I could have. I could have been simpler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but anyway, I, I wanted to do a proof by contradiction, so here you go. <laughs> so, well, I guess I could have done it in the other way, but I, I so here I'm, I'm saying a corollary of the previous thing is that if, you ha if you're typable in an empty context, then you're closed. And I'm doing this by, I have to reproduce this, this pattern here. So I have this for all parallel statement kind of that says, well, for all x, we're going to ensure that x is not in the free variable of t. And I'm doing this by first assuming that it is, and then showing that you get a contradiction, because if it's in the free variable of t, then by the previous uh, lemma, we know that it must be in this context, but this context is empty. So yeah, I think maybe if, uh, if, I, if I try to change it, as you said, it, this, this proof would also look simpler. OK. So one more, it's just the context invariance. Uh, I'm not, again, it's, it's one that's proved automatically. It's, uh, it's just saying that if, if, um, if C and C prime agree on all three variables of T, then they should agree on the type as well. OK, so now this is, we're coming to the hardest part, with it, which is the substitution lemma. And this is also notoriously tricky in, in, in many, in many uh, calculus once you, w once you do extensions. So this says that basically substitution preserves typing. And this statement is actually a bit hard to read. The reason is that I'm, I don't want to be adding extra variables here. So I, I, I can't really, the only way I have of referring to this, um, this type, which uh, I, know, I know it has some type, and the only way I have to referring to it is, is by this expression, like, uh, this dot get. But this basically says that if S has some type S, capital S in an empty context, and T has type T in a context extended with X having type S, then if you do the substitution, you have the same type as well. And really, the only interesting case when we did the model was for variable and application. So this is the only cases where we have to guide Daphne a little bit. And we're, we're using the previous lemmas. In, in key places. Okay. So you mean you have to guide Daphne yeah. by writing uh, so the insert or by yes. exactly so I, the terms. yeah so 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 the way it works is that um, let's say I comment this out. Well, okay, I, yeah. So then it's it's complaining, and the squiggly is here which means that it's really like a, a different case that it's complaining about. So then I can, I can try to figure this out by doing, like say, T app, for example. Is this the problematic case? And then I do if T var. Is this the problematic case? And then. Uh, Uh, 
I'll just add this for. Yeah, so then it's complaining. Well, okay, now it was complaining about this case. So I know that this is the case I need to, to worry about. What do you need to do? I understand. Yeah, so then I, I, I need to, it, it tells me I need to show that this post condition holds for this case. So, yeah, so it's saying this, this post condition here with this quickly doesn't, it doesn't know that it's hold for this case. So I need to help it. And the way I help it is by saying, okay, well, if you look at the T bar case, if you look actually at um, the way it was done in the, um, in the has type function, I'm just going to make this. If you look here, then you see that, um, well, actually, in, in the substitution, what you see is that it has, it has these two cases. So if x is equal to x prime, then s is t. So this means that here I also really have two cases to consider. If the id is equal to x, else this. And now we see that Daphne is really confused only about this case. Yeah. And so now I, I, can, I can keep drilling and, and understand why is this case tricky. Well, the reason it's tricky is that we're, we're actually using the... So this is the case where we're doing the substitution. And the reason it's tricky is that we're actually using the fact that S is closed to do the context invariance. So like, mm -hmm. if you don't know the proof a priori, like this doesn't give you, like you, you can say you can dig, but it's not that you can really have like the game. Well, in, in some ways it's, uh, it's, it's like what, uh, what uh, so Cobb gives you this interactive context and say, okay, this is the case that you need to worry about. So here is the same, except you have the flexibility of choosing in which order you do the case, because you know what you're in doing a derivation on, or you... No, I know, but when I look at this proof, and mm -hmm. what you say, there is nothing that tells me that that's what I have to do. Yeah, so it's interactive. I mean, you, you, you try it out. Yeah. Okay, but mm -hmm. I, I really don't understand why a 30 equals equals s is the... Why it's there? Well, okay, maybe it doesn't... Need, it's, it's just also for my understanding. Like, I know that I'm in the case that is that is a variable and where the, where the substitution is happening. So I know that I'm substituting um, x is just, here t is just x, and I'm doing the substitution, so this whole thing just becomes s. So then the type of this thing, which was, which, which was t, we defined it to be t, we know that this has to be the same as s. You have like prints or something that can give you an intermediate status of why it's confused or something like that? Is there a way? Uh, yeah, there is a way, but I, I haven't used the debugging support much. Okay. So, so now, um, for preservation, it's really just using the substitution lemma in the case where it applies and the rest it does automatically. And that's it. We're, we're, we're pretty much done. Now I'm just defining what is a normal form and stuck is a, is, is a normal form that isn't a value. And then I can show type soundness by using this progress and preservation. So that's the, yeah, that's, that's the generic part. So now what I want to show is um, how modular the proofs are. What I did is I added some extensions. So I added Boolean types, nat uh, number, natural types, and I also added iso-recursive types, which are this fold-unfold um, operation. I'll show an example of this later. And this is all like, uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, Daphne doesn't have pragmas, but I basically uh, co can comment this in and out. And what's interesting is that, okay, the model has to change, right? The model is, is changing. I mean, my, my values now include natural numbers and these folds. And, and then, uh, so, so the model changes quite a bit, and that's expected. I mean, you're, after all, you're doing um, a new calculus. But then what's really interesting is that for this case, uh, yeah, so sorry, I'm just going to scroll down. OK, and just to show, like, I'm actually using this. So I have examples of Boolean naturals and this fold thing. But what's interesting is that the type safety properties stay the same. So the proofs that we had before are exactly the same. Nothing has changed. And the reason is that if you look at the proofs, the only interesting parts are for abstraction 
and variables and the, the application part really wasn't mentioned anywhere and, and so this new stuff is still by induction on the congruence and everything just works. And I, I added this isorecursive type because I actually wanted to find a case where it doesn't work and so that I could show how I would extend the proof, but it still worked. So, <laughs> so I got, uh, yeah. So I think that's pretty cool. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at, at how to achieve this in Coq, you really need to have the insight beforehand to, to structure your proofs in the right way. And just to show that things are actually um, working nicely, so if I add a mistake, for example, if in has type, I change, um, I change I change the, the if statement so that the if expression so that it doesn't check that both branches are the same. Then hopefully I should get some error somewhere. So this tells you when it's done. I mean I, I haven't enabled the caching because uh, it wasn't there was some issues with it, but this should tell you when or then it would be too fast and you'd blow the audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so anyway, so it says that it can't prove preservation anymore. And you can kind of dig in on what the problem is. So I can say f is the problem in t if. Well, here I know it's there, but I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of have a suspicion where I could even ask it, is the problem with t fold, for example? Or is it the problem somewhere else? And it tells me, yeah, the problem is here. And then since here I'm doing, um, I'm kind of doing a case analysis on the stepping functions. Uh, yeah, so here it's, it's recomputing because when there's the, the purple line, it's, it's recomputing. So I know that the problem is here and I can look at the stepping function. And I have the, the three cases here. So yeah, so it says it cannot show this. And if I add these three cases to tell me which one is it complaining about, it begins with it. Yeah. So you need IDE support for doing this all this stuff. Yeah, otherwise it's hard, yeah. I mean you can you can also yeah, it's it would be too much um, the cycle would be too slow if you do it from the from the command line. No, no, no. I, I meant that these edits should be supported by some sort of proof debugger. You shouldn't be having to modify ah, okay. or this sort of thing. I yeah. mean, it, it seems like, well, okay. it yeah. seems like there's an opportunity to sort of have some notion of a proof debugger that's allowing you to simulate the effect. It's sort of like, these, like a crop, uh, you know, strategy where you can say, okay, do a case play, it shows you all the different things yeah. you have to consider. Mm -hmm. You could do the same thing yeah. here. You could just in line, in line right. exactly. that you need to consider. Yeah, that's now. true. That was also my main comment before. And another thing is, uh, so it should be probably in some way incremental, the way the, the prover works. Because it seems you're reproving everything when the bug is in the same place over and over. So perhaps yeah. it does it already, maybe. Yeah. Well, there, turned off the cache. Yeah, I turned oh, off the cache. The but I mean, it's because I wanted to make sure that it was squiggling all the time. Yeah. But anyway, so that's, that's one thing. Um, so now you know that the problem is here, and if you look at the stepping function, it's gonna step to the, to the uh, else branch, and since we, if we have something that looks like this, uh, I mean, this, this used to have type nat because of the way the, the wrong function, the wrong typing rule worked, and now it has type true T true, which is different. So you know that there is a problem. So anyway, so this was just to show uh, some, some support. I mean, I guess now I have, uh, it's already 2.10. Two and so um, I, I, I can discuss a little bit more. Uh, yeah? I'm not very familiar with Daphne in general. So what's like expressivity wise, what are the, what's the relation with Coq and Daphne? What's uh, like, uh, which logics do you use? What's the so, yeah, so Daphne, for example, doesn't have uh, higher order functions, which is, which is a big limitation, really, for, for especially in, in this kind of setting. But usually you can represent, so say in Coq you would use an environment for things, uh, like a partial function environment, and here you can use a map, right, and things like this. So uh, otherwise, 
in COC, you have this, these relations that allow you to define um, inductively what your evidence looks like. And in Daphne, you can use predicates for this, but it doesn't have quite the same expressivity, especially in terms of, um, of like uh, termination and co-induction, because co-inductive relations have uh, certain properties and things. But um, yeah, I've been able to do quite some uh, fancy systems in, in Daphne. So one thing, for example, is doing logical relations. It's very hard to do in COG because you have a lot of mutual inductions. But in Daphne, I can just use a step index and, and it works quite well. OK, any more questions? Yeah, so that, that's it for the, for the demo part. I thought um, this example was, was nice because it, it, it shows that uh, Daphne can do a lot of the, the proving itself, and, and you can really focus on the interesting case. The way I actually use it in practice is I, I, I work top down. So I start with, uh, with the theorem I want to prove, and then whenever a case gets complicated, I just make up a lemma for this case, and I, I keep going. And then, and then later I realize, oh, maybe this lemma is too general, it's never going to hold, and I refine it. And what's nice then is that if the original proof works with the more precise lemma, it still, it still, it still works. And it's not like in COC where when you create a lemma, the, the exact uh, form of the lemma really matters for how you're going to, to use it in the proofs. So what I mean here is that um, I'll use an example from, from my presentation. Um, yeah, so first I thought I needed this lemma, which, which I guess you would need to understand the calculus, but it's basically saying that if you have it's basically the subtyping inversion. If you have um, two paths and their types are subtypes of each other and you can get something from P, then you should also be able to get something from, well, this should be a P prime here. You should get something from P prime and it should be in a subtyping relation. And the problem is then I, I found out that this doesn't hold in my calculus, which is strange because you would, you would kind of expect this. But then I realized that if I just add the additional rule P reduces to P prime, all my, all my proofs were, were still going through because in every case Daphne managed to prove that P does reduce to P prime. And then I was able to, to keep it as it is just by refining the lemma. How do you find that in one of the in So I, I found out that it didn't hold by just looking at it and trying to, uh, to prove it for a little bit and seeing in which case I got stuck and then I came up with a counterexample. Okay. So uh, any questions about Daphne? So I thought I'd, I'd end up by showing how I've been using Daphne in my own research. So ju just give a, a quick introduction to what I've been working on uh, with Martin Odersky and others at EPFL. Mm -hmm. You just showed the public available. Yeah. It's on your page. It's, uh, the, it's I mean, on the, the proof of uh, Yeah, it's on GitHub. Uh, Daphne Sandbox, okay. and there are other there are other things there actually. Thank you. Okay. So what we're trying to do with this dependent object types calculus is capture a core uh, feature of Scala, which is path dependent types, and the goal is to really uh, have this core calculus be, be what every other Scala type um, maps to. So we would only have these path dependent types, these abstract type members, and we would still model uh, Scala's mixture of nominal and structural typing, but only through refinement types. And then everything else that Scala has, like higher kind of types, existential types, we, we wouldn't really model directly in the calculus. We also don't want to model inheritance. Uh, these would be expressed by, um, by um, <coughs> translation to the calculus. And just to give an example, uh, just to give a, a brief overview of the syntax, what we have is that the types are the most interesting part. This is what we're trying to capture. So we start with a, a bottom and a top type. And then we have these refinement types, which um, allow you to say that we are extending this 
this type T with a set of declarations. And declarations can be values and methods as usual, but also types. And if they're types, you specify them by giving a lower bound type and an upper bound type. And because, um, because types can have types as members, you need, when you have an object of a certain type, you, you should be able to refer to, to these type members. And this is what is done with these path dependent types. So p.l means take the type member l from p, and that's also a type. Mm -hmm. To make it concrete, so I could have like a, an object uh, bit array and its element of oh, it. Yeah. So to make it concrete, you can have an animal and it has some type meal, which is, which is upper bounded by food. So you would say the lower bound is bottom and the upper bound is food and dot. And then you can extend this animal with a cow and you would say that here meal is just grass, so it's upper bounded and lower bounded by, by grass. And then you can reason about these things. So if you have an animal, you can't really feed it anything if all you know about it is that it's an animal. Because if I could feed an animal uh, yeah, okay, well, meat, then if it's a cow, that wouldn't be so good. So, uh, and the, the reason why this works in the calculus is that whatever this type is, it has to be a lower bound of a dot meal. And you don't really know what a dot meal is, but you can open it up. And since we're, we're doing um, subtyping on the right with meal, we open it up by looking at the lower bound. And here we have bottom. So we cannot feed it anything. On the other hand, if we have a cow, we can feed it grass for the same reason. Yeah, so this is to make it concrete. But, but really, the point is we just have these type selections and refinement types, so it's pretty minimal. And then we extend it with type intersections and unions in a classical way to get a subtyping lattice. And so the, the goal was to really have just a minimal set of types and then uh, try to see where we can go from there. One, one key motivation from Scala was that currently in Scala, it, it doesn't have these classical intersection and union types, which means that when you compute the greatest lower bound and the least upper bound, things have to be done in an eager fashion, and you can get into um, into types that 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 are actually uh, approximated by an infinite sequence. And in in dot, this would be solved by really just uh, oh I forgot this one. Yeah, so in, in dot, this would be solved because you would just say that well. Uh, we, we just want the least upper bound of C and D, and that's just a type by itself. So we're kind of delaying the problem to when we need to expand this type and look at it. OK, so the, the calculus itself is, is, a, is sim the syntax is rather simple, but in terms of judgment, it gets a bit complicated. Like you have the usual type assignment, subtyping, well-formedness. But you also have this expansion, which allows you to flatten, look at what, are, what is really the set of declarations in a type. Because you can have nested refinements, refinements with intersections, union, and things. And then membership, which allows you to select a particular declaration from a term. And uh, so if we look at the, at the example where we're, where we're looking at um, a function that has uh, an apply method, and we're taking the, the union with another function with an apply method, then in practice, what that means is that if we, if we, if we type an application of this function, we need, to, we need to take the, this is the type of the function, but when we expand it, we get this type for the apply method. And so we see that the, the, the computation is done at, uh, at at the time where you actually need to know, uh, no, it's not done at the time where the function, when the type is defined, but at the time where the, the type is used. So this was just to give you a, a flavor. And for, for, this, for this concrete example of animals, what happens with these bounds is that when we're refining animal, we still have to keep this, um, we still have to, to use these, these bounds from animal and from, from cow together. So the way we do it is that for, the, for, for, this, for this refinement of animal here, we have that the, the, this reads that the lower bound is grass or bottom, and the upper bound is grass or food. 
and that just reduces to grass or grass. So that works fine here, but if instead we just said that, okay, meal can just be food with a lower bound of food, then here we would get bad bounds. We would get food to grass. And this means that, in practice, this means that this type can never be instantiated because when we, when we create a type, we check that the bounds are good. Is this, is mm -hmm. this global? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, and w one interesting aspect is that we don't really have a separate class table for things, um, the nominality comes in really just through these path-dependent types, which means that here, if I, if I have something that is, a, that, is a, that is a poodle, then I know that it's a pet because if it's a poodle, I can, I can open it up and see that, okay, I, I really just need to compare dog to pet, and then I can compare pet to pet. So by ref eventually, every subtyping rule on path-dependent types, if, um, if there's no structural aspect, it, it reaches a, a reflexivity part on the chain. Okay, and, and then I just wanted to give a flavor of the kind of issues we have. So one example is that we need to take path equality in, into account because here, there's no need to understand this code in detail, but the gist of it is that a dot i dot l reduces to b dot l, and b dot l has this type that depends on b. And a dot i dot l has this type a dot i dot x that depends on, on, uh, on a dot i. So somehow now we need to be able to relate these two types, but on a first, um, on a first approximation, they're not equal because a dot i dot x has a lower bound of bottom, which means that here we can't really compare it to b dot x by opening it up. But we know something more. We know that a dot i reduces to b, so it works in this case. But somehow that means that your typing model needs to take path equality into account. You only, you only know it here because you, you write i equals b. Yeah. Uh, it could be a different fault oh, you made. Yeah, exactly. So if here it was... It's dependent, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's... Uh, it's uh, yeah, it depends on, on what is in your store. Yeah. I mean, this is only true because a dot i reduces to b. If a dot i was reducing to b prime, it wouldn't be true anymore. Or if you yeah. couldn't statically yeah. figure so out what yeah. it will reduce to. Right? Yeah, but that's, that's, uh, that becomes an issue only when you have things in the store. So it's really something that's chosen when you have preservation. And yeah, this, this, uh, this is also related to the subtyping inversion where you, where you can, where you really, where you, where really, you really need to add the close P reduces to P prime in this, in, in this lemma for it to actually work. And initially we also had some very strange issues with well-formedness. One tricky aspect here is that you have these intersections that are somewhat delayed because um, you, something looks fine. So if you just look at the, the type over here, down here, it looks fine by itself. And it's only when x dot l is refined to be this type here that you have a problem. And the problem is that if you look at the red types by themselves, then you have that b refers to a, and then here a refers to b. So there's like a cyclic dependency between them. And somehow if you try to Ensure, depending on your well-formedness rules, you might get stuck in the most precise type and not in the, in the previous uh, situation. So that's just to give a flavor. I mean, we're, uh, in, uh, in summary, what we've been doing is, is really actually using Daphne to, to help guide the design of the calculus <coughs> also and, and figure out what do we really need to, for preservation to hold. And we're also looking at alternatives using logical relations and big step semantics uh, for this calculus. So yeah, that's it. Any questions? So have you represented some of the rules in this language in Daphne already? The yeah. On slide six. The uh, yeah. So I have the. So this one is a very big uh, development, actually. So it, it's, it probably doesn't completely. Um, it's a timeout in the IDE, but 
it doesn't completely like uh, there are some timeouts in the ID when you run it, but the the gist of it is you have this <coughs> this. But I'm gonna remove the other things. So I'm just gonna make this bigger. So the main thing is that we have typing for paths. And the typing also takes a store and a context, and it returns a type for the path. And here I'm using what Nick Hill mentioned before. I'm using this predicate approach, not this uh, function approach. And I'm also always using a step index, so that whenever I have a, any recursive call, I'm, I'm just um, decreasing the step index, which allows me to, to really do mutual induction proofs easily just based on that. And then, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we have like all sorts of other things like well formed declarations and everything, well formed type. And then you can see, for example, this membership rule is, is not very uh, constructive, right? It just says, well, I mean, it's using existentials a lot and, and, and things like this. So, so you can do that sort of thing as well. So, uh, about the end, so in, in Cog, mm -hmm. a lot of times people will define things like typing as data types. Mm -hmm. And then you can do induction on those data types. Yeah. It, uh, do you find that using this natural number is, is a better way to do that induction? Or? So I, I, I miss a little bit being able to do uh, inductive evidence, like kind of data types in the, in the, in the prop world in Coq. But on the other hand, in Coq, mutual induction is quite tricky. I mean, sure, it does some part of it automatically for you. But then you have to do a lot of work to, to get it started, right? And here I have so many judgments that using the step index is just so much easier. Like Daphne can, can always say, okay, this is decreasing and, and, and then I can, I can do my proofs. Of course, the catch is that if, uh, if I have a sort of uh, unintended cyclic dependencies, which means that for some derivation, it always goes to zero, then that's not so great. But yeah, so I need to watch out for this. But in general, it's been, it's been rather nice to do that. Like just to show also one, one thing I didn't really do too much is that because I'm using the step index, I need to actually show that things are monotonic. Like if you increase the step index, you still, you still get the, the same types. Yeah. And so, so there is these ghost lemmas that do this. And this, I, I mean, I didn't bother to prove them more. Like some of them I just assume for now and, and, and keep going with this. Okay, so I guess it's. Yeah, it's I, guess I, have a mm -hmm. well, I mean, this is really awesome. Right? I mm -hmm. really, really like it. But if, if for a moment I'm going to uh, play the role of a, you know, uh, a grumpy uh, uh, mm -hmm. cock person, uh, <laughs> you know, I'll just say Frenchman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, a, a, a criticism that such a person may raise is that well, you know, type systems are inherently these constructive things that you work with, and you, know, you get nice constructive proofs out of out of Koch, and you can interpret Koch theorems in the calculus of constructions and stuff. Um, what can you say here? Yeah, that's. I mean, well, hopefully, I guess you're you're getting to maybe having a verified core of Daphne, but I don't know. For me, it's it's really just. Um, uh, right now, my concern is really okay. I'm doing this this research calculus. Can I? How do I? How do I uh, get some guidance on, on proving it sound when there are so many hairy issues? And I find that doing things in Daphne allows me to focus on the big picture. I mean, eventually, maybe it's it, you. Maybe it, it's not convincing to everyone. But for me, it's it fo it focuses on the big picture. I can really. I don't need to do this low-level manipulation to get the, the exact proof term that I need for, for, uh, for something. But I mean, under the hood, I think if, if Z3 is, uh, is sound, then things are fine, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's the, the classical versus constructive style. Which, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, guess, uh, I guess maybe one way I might look at it is to say, well, you know, there is, um, 
uh, there's a community of people who are doing hand proofs. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a community of people these days who do, you know, metal theory and cop. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, maybe this is sort of, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle. You don't necessarily get the tiny TCB that you may get from cop, but it's certainly like way better than a hand proof. So yeah. um, maybe we don't need like micro TCBs for everything. And, and I, I think especially for teaching, Daphne has a lot of potential because the way it does induction is, is very natural. So even just learning these concepts, it's, it's, it would be much easier in Daphne than, than in, in, in COG where you have to learn all this mach machinery and the stepping curve is really high. Mm -hmm. Daphne uses some concepts that you already kind of understand, which is contracts yeah. and, and, and bootstraps from there to do more serious proving. Generating these proofs where you plot the empty code places, but you mm -hmm. need to output what it's moving? Um, I don't know. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, I mean, you, one thing you can do is you can also, if you really want to, so it depends wh why you're doing the proof, right? If you really want to, if you're doing it as a bigger, beginner stu student trying to understand progress, then this is not so helpful, right? That is just saying, well, that's done. So one thing you can do is really do, say here, induction false, and then you yourself try to do the steps manually. And I mean, in this case, it wouldn't be so hard. It would still help you with other aspects. But there is, there is a yeah, there is a way to to try to get more insights. So one way to think about it is that the that if if this is saving human time to do the proofs in the first place, then if you're if you're really wondering about, uh, I mean, is it a sound proof, um, then one could imagine that one would take uh, the proofs that Z3 constructs, map them back to, well, first of all, generate those proofs, and then uh, map that back somehow to the boogie level and then to the uh, Daphne level. And I mean, that would be a, a large project uh, to do. But, um, but I mean, some people like doing that. And uh, if it's, I mean, if it would mean a lot to a lot of people, uh, it could be done. I, I guess I just if there's some way to get the proof in a format that's verifiable by something that is itself verifiable. Uh, right. No. Yeah. Well, there's some three things that comes, comes out. And but its notion of what a, a proof is is then needs to be manipulated and fed to something else mm -hmm. that would then end up, you want independent verification. Right. right. And so it's it's possible, but it's it's a big project. Right. It's mm -hmm. a big Because Z3 still does it's proof still at yeah. fairly big steps, right? It's as a, as I think it, it's compared to some other things, right? And but one could also so it really depends that, on what you're using as the uh, checker. Okay. And one could also imagine that such a project, I mean, such a project could be a very large one. But if you started with something that, like in these examples, use uh, functions and data types, um, maybe there's a, I mean, more direct translation of these proofs and uh, and the input to let's say Isabel or something that. Um, or call for that matter. Nothing is there now. But you can, um, the, uh, I guess you didn't show it here, the, the calc statement, right? The, um, uh, yeah, sometimes when you, when you write your proofs yourselves, instead of having just the certs uh, and calls out to, to Lamas, you can use um, verified calculations. And those are quite readable, I mean, human readable. Uh, yeah, there was just one trick like regarding the capture avoiding substitution. So you can do a renaming, like, like here. Well, this is for like uh, type substitution, but it's the same thing. But the, the problem then is that the decreasing clause is, is a bit, you need to decrease on the size of your, of your data type instead of the, of the, of the actual structural uh, look of the data type. But you can also do this in Daphne quite easily by defining your own decreasing measures and things. OK. deeply impressive. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so that is here till till the end of the week. So if you um, if you want to um, 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 get more uh, parts of her brain, then let me know. Or if you want to show her the um, your latest um, things, whatever that might be. Um, thanks very much. Thank you.